This video is sponsored by Wren. Stick around to the end to find out how you can help fight climate change. Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm reaching back down to the very bottom of the creationist barrel to look at another video by Not a Dr. Gene Kim. Usually I don't challenge credentials given that I have none myself, but for Gene I do make an exception. I'm not going to go into it for this one, but I will leave a link to my first encounter with him where I explain why, so go watch that if you want to know. Anyway, in this video he claims that the top radiometric dating method proves that God is real. I'm not sure what he means by top though. If I assume that it means most accurate, then I guess that would probably be uranium lead dating, which is typically over 99% accurate. My guess, though, is that he's actually going to go with carbon dating, because that one's actually fairly easy to make it look like it's got massive issues, as long as you just ignore the fact that there are well-known limitations with the method. And just for the record, he does spend a lot of time writing without saying anything, or just flat out repeating himself, so I will be chopping him up liberally. As always, link to the original videos in the description if you want to just make sure I'm not dishonestly editing him. Let's go! Carbon-14 dating, for people who don't know, carbon-14 dating, what they like to do is that they would take a certain fossil... Seven seconds in and he's already wrong. This might be a new record. Well, depending on what he means by fossil, of course, he doesn't specify leaving people to picture things like dinosaur fossils that are millions of years old. Those don't get carbon dated, partly because of carbon-14's short half-life, there wouldn't be any C14 left by the time we dig them up, and partly because most fossils of that age are completely permineralized, meaning that even if C14 had a longer half-life, there wouldn't be any carbon in them anyway, as it has all been replaced with other minerals like silica and iron, which do not contain carbon. Though certainly carbonate mineralizations are a thing that happens sometimes, but generally it happens to plants that lived in acidic environments like peat bogs where an abundance of carbonic acid would contribute to the process. So yeah, some fossils that are younger than about 75,000 years could potentially be carbon dated, but in most cases it's just not applicable. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't finish this section with the admittedly very fun but oversimplification that was popularized by Potholer54. Oi! Kim! There's no fucking carbon in it! And also I should mention that by itself that is an oversimplification, but Potholer54 didn't leave it at that. He also explained that this objection only applies to completely permineralized fossils, so lest you think I was dunking on him there. And then you gotta realize this. Uh, all matter of life will have this kind of carbon within them. And then when the fossil dies, this is one of the elements that's retained within the fossils. Eh, sort of. Stop saying fossils, just say organisms. All life ingests carbon, a certain percentage of it will be carbon-14, and for terrestrial organisms the ratio of carbon-14 to stable carbon-12 will be approximately equal to the atmospheric ratio. It's most accurate in plants, which get their carbon directly from the atmosphere, slightly less accurate in animals further down the food chain that get their carbon from the plants and or other animals that they eat, and it can get really wonky when we start talking about marine environments and the reservoir effect, where some organisms get their carbon from carboniferous rocks like limestone, and other organisms get their carbon from eating the guys that get it from the rocks. Also, the atmospheric ratio has changed over time, it is not a constant, and so that must be taken into account when calculating dates using carbon-14. So by measuring the amount of carbon-14 inside a fossil, we can guess how old the fossil is. Again, mentally switching the word fossil to something that might actually get carbon dated, it's not a guess, it's a calculation, and one that when done properly, on appropriate samples, is incredibly accurate. And evolutionists would like to use this to prove the old age. Well, if I wanted to just prove an old age, I'd go for one of the radiometric dating methods that gets us to older ages than carbon does, like the aforementioned uranium lead dating. Rubidium strontium would work for that as well, and basically any method which can give us a date calculation using the isochron method takes care of any assumptions that creationists like to complain about with regards to radiometric dating. It's a difficult concept to wrap your brain around, so rather than go into detail about that here, I'll leave a link to another video where I think I explain that fairly well. So we're gonna, in this particular video, we're not gonna debunk this, we're actually gonna do something else that's really interesting. We're gonna use this to prove younger age. Press X to doubt. Now you might say, no, carbon-14 dating proves older age. Well actually, if they were really honest, 
with carbon-14 dating, not picking and choosing like they've always done, then you can find an absolute younger age. I mean, your side's the one that keeps picking and choosing examples from studies that were conducted specifically to show what the limitations of carbon dating are, all while ignoring the fact that that was the purpose of those studies, and ignoring all the other times when it's shown through confirmation with multiple other dating methods, a lot of which creationists even agree with, to be accurate when properly applied. But do go on. The atmosphere on the Earth, so let's make this the atmosphere right here, it has carbon here. Now here's the thing, if you measure the amount of, uh, if you go by carbon-14 dating and measure, uh, measure the amount that's within the atmosphere around our Earth, it's actually going to prove not billions of years. I think this is him awkwardly going for the argument that, given the rate that cosmic rays are producing carbon-14 in our atmosphere today, if we extrapolate that backward, carbon-14 production can only have just begun at most about 10,000 years ago. Of course, this assumes that carbon-14 is produced at a constant rate over time, and we know this to not be the case. There are many things that can affect its production rate, from fluctuations in the Earth's magnetic field to solar activity to climatic cycles, and that's not even getting into humans messing with the carbon concentrations in every way from just burning coal to testing nukes. There's a founder of the carbon-14 dating method. His name is Dr. Willard Libby. He's the founder. You know, it's always amusing to me that creationists insist on referring to researchers as the founders of whatever they are researching. It's more amusing when applied to Darwin, as he just described something that happens in nature. He didn't make it start happening. But it's still amusing here, even though you could say that he founded this particular dating method. It's still a weird way to say it. I personally phrase it more as he discovered this method, as the whole thing is just based on performing calculations on parameters that he didn't have any influence on. But this does just kind of show that people like Not A Dr. Kim need everything to be based on authority. The founder of Christianity was ostensibly Jesus, though I would argue that it was actually Paul, and that applies whether you're a mythicist or not. But anyway, assuming it's actually Jesus, Jesus is the most important guy in Christianity who can say or do nothing wrong. So obviously the first scientist to discover something like radiometric dating is the founder who could never have been wrong about it, right? Well, no, actually. Science works in pretty much the exact opposite way. The first person to ever discover something is likely to be significantly more wrong about it than the scientists who come later, because the ones who come later have the advantage of more scientific discoveries that have shed more light on the topic than the original discoverer did. My favorite example of this actually is Darwin. He had no idea how traits were passed on through generations in organisms, and his ideas that he did have were just completely and utterly wrong. Because when he was doing his work, genetics had not yet been discovered. Or rather, they were being discovered around the same time. But Darwin was not aware of Mendel's work, though Mendel was very much aware of Darwin. He says that if we were to go for somewhere between 20 to 30,000 years, we would reach equilibrium here in carbon. I think you misunderstood the point, buddy. It's not about equilibrium. In fact, one of the creationist objections to carbon dating is the idea that it assumes that the Earth is already at an equilibrium point, which is a false assumption, because currently carbon-14 is forming at 1.3 times the rate at which it decays, meaning that the levels of carbon-14 are actually increasing in the atmosphere. This is usually where creationists will assume that this is a constant, and then extrapolate backward to find that the Earth cannot be more than 10,000 years old. But not a Dr. Kim is unique among creationists, so let's see where he's going. So with this example, let me use an example of a water fountain here, okay? So let's say that this is a water fountain right here. It's going to be empty at the beginning, right? When you start off from scratch and then the water starts to pour, it's going to start filling up, right? That's not typically how water fountains work. Most recirculate a set amount of water, but I'll allow it for the sake of the analogy. But here's the thing. When it starts to uh, pour up, if you don't put holes in it, what's going to happen? Then the water's going to fill up and fall out, right? Now let's say that we put some holes right here, okay? A decent amount of holes where the water will not fill up all the way. So we put these holes and then the water will come out of these holes. Yeah, and that's supposed to be radiometric decay. Though, to make this analogy accurate, the holes would have to be such that the water level can keep rising past them, thereby continuing the buildup of carbon. 
Now, what happens to the water after that? Is it going to go higher, higher, and then spill over? Well, if we're analogizing this to the Earth and carbon-14, then yeah, I guess? No. Oh, well, please enlighten me. Is it going to get smaller and smaller and become empty? No. It's going to reach somewhere in the middle, right? Yeah. Only if the holes are sized such that the amount of water that escapes the fountain is equal to that which is put in. Since carbon-14 is currently produced faster than it decays, this means that the holes are too small, so the fountain will fill up. Wherever that middle line is, right? This is what we'll refer to as equilibrium, all right? Okay, so your entire argument is based on an assumption that not even other creationists agree with? Well done. You've constructed an argument that will be rejected by even the most fervent of young earthers. Now, let's fix it up to a point where at least Kent Hovind will accept it. He's still pretty close to the bottom of the barrel, but he's a little higher up than Gene here. The holes in the fountain have to be such that when taken together, they will let more water out than is flowing in, and they have to be well spread out from top to bottom. Eventually, such a fountain will reach an equilibrium point that comes before the overflow point. And this works better as an analogy, because the more carbon-14 is in the atmosphere, the more molecules of it will decay. So the decay rate remains the same, but the total number of atoms undergoing decay will increase. Eventually, assuming that this accumulation rate is constant, the atmosphere will reach an equilibrium point where the same number of atoms are decaying as are created. Typically, other creationists will make this analogy with a hypothetical perforated barrel rather than a fountain, but I guess not a Dr. Kim wanted to change the analogy enough to be able to take credit for it himself, and in the process, he broke it. Now, Will or Libby say within 20 to 30,000 years, it's going to hit that equilibrium point. I can't actually find any references to Libby suggesting such a thing, though I'm not excluding that as a possibility. Maybe he did mention it at some point, but the person who I am definitely seeing as promoting this idea is Henry Morris, the founder of the modern creationist movement in a more accurate sense of the word founder than when not a Dr. Kim called Willard Libby the founder of carbon dating. So this form of the idea came from a creationist. I have no doubt that it had its basis in something real, but usually creationists have to pervert the real things in order to make them say what they want to say. So this version of the idea came from a creationist. But most modern creationist organizations have pivoted away from this particular argument because it doesn't fit in with the typical creationist claim that Noah's flood would have drastically impacted all radiometric dating methods. Also, the sources that Morris used to come to that conclusion were published in 1963, which was before the variations in C14 production were fully documented. Though, as usual with creationists, in order to reach his conclusion, he had to ignore the fact that the very paper he cited to come up with the time to equilibrium of about 30,000 years explained that the rate of C14 production would have been affected by variations in the Earth's magnetic field, a prediction that was later confirmed, along with discovering other factors that can also affect it. Now, this alone is enough to completely discard the argument. To go back to the perforated barrel analogy, it would be like having someone at the tap that's filling up the barrel constantly fiddling with it, so that sometimes more water leaks out than is entering through the hose, and at others more is entering through the hose than is leaking. Since it changes so frequently and pretty well unpredictably, you can't use this as a basis for calculating how long the tap has been filling up the barrel. Now, do you know what's amazing? When you start out from scratch, brand new water fountain, and then you put holes, the water's going to start filling up until you hit the point of equilibrium. Yes? Same thing with the Earth. Let's start out a brand new Earth, and we start to put in all this carbon. It's going to assimilate, build up, until we hit equilibrium, right? Okay, guess what? We did not reach even reach that point yet. Of course not. To reach that point would require the rate of C14 production to remain constant which it does not. And this is not an assumption. We can directly measure the C14 content of past atmospheres through several methods, including taking ice core samples and dendrochronology. Here's an even more surprising one. Didn't you know carbon is building up faster? It's, it's supposed to build up faster. Faster than what? This is literally all he says about this. He changes topics back to the 20 to 30,000 year time frame to reach equilibrium right after this. I am completely baffled. Uh, Willer Libby, he quotes concerning 20 to 30,000 years, if the cosmic radiation has remained at its present intensity for 20 or 30,000 years. That's a pretty big if. Well, actually, that's not really all that big an if. Cosmic radiation is pretty constant over time. 
But it's more of a question of how much of that cosmic radiation reaches the atmosphere, because both the Earth's magnetic field and solar wind deflect quite a lot of it, and we know that neither of those things are constant. So sometimes they would allow more radiation in, other times they would keep more out. And if the carbon reservoir has not changed appreciably in this time, then there exists at the present time a complete balance between the rate of disintegration of radiocarbon atoms and the rate of assimilation of new radiocarbon atoms for all material in the life cycle. Okay, that was an actual quote, and it gave me enough to find where Libby actually said that. It was in his 1952 book, Radiocarbon Dating. Admittedly, probably the first place I should have looked. My bad. However, this statement is not him talking about the atmosphere being in equilibrium. It's talking about the ratio of C14 to C12 in a living organism being in equilibrium with the ratio in the atmosphere. Let's read the next couple of sentences to provide some context, shall we? For example, a tree, or any other living organism, is in a state of equilibrium between the cosmic radiation and the natural rate of disintegration of radiocarbon, so long as it is alive. In other words, during the lifetime, the radiocarbon assimilation from food will just balance the radiocarbon disintegration in the tissues. When death occurs, however, the assimilation process is abruptly halted, and only the disintegration process remains. Now, Libya was working before we developed the first radiocarbon calibration curve, which corrects for the fact that C14 production has not been a constant over time, and his work reflects that fact. The dates he got were only accurate to about the last 4,900 years, a fact that I found in a book that, rather annoyingly, is titled the same as Libby's book, Radiocarbon Dating, but this time by Sheridan Bowman and published in 1990. Libby knew when he was working that the assumption that the C14 production rate is a constant was likely a faulty assumption, and he never took it lightly. That's actually probably why he caveated this particular statement with that 20 to 30,000 year range for it being stable. That's stable enough that the dates that you get would be accurate, while still allowing for variation in the production rate outside of that window. Of course, we now know that it wasn't stable in that window, but we can't fault the guy for working with what he had. He's saying we would have reached equilibrium, a balance point between assimilation and disintegration. No, he's saying that organisms reach an equilibrium point with their environment. Okay, he said right here, the assimilation production rate is 18.8, .8, whereas the decay is 16.1. No, he did not say that, with he being Libby. Whatever creationist you're copying your homework from said that. This is the founder of carbon-14 dating. Yeah, I knew I had to draw this. We were going to get lost if I didn't do it that way. Yeah, no. Honestly, I'm actually more lost with you doing it that way. And it doesn't actually matter who calculated the grams per minute decay and accumulation rate for the atmosphere. Maybe it was Libby, and you just missed the spot in whatever article you're reading where it transitioned from quoting him to just summarizing parts of his findings. The specific numbers don't matter. All that matters is that this is not a constant, and so it cannot be used to calculate the age of the Earth. But it gets even worse for evolutionists, because this is a guy named Robert Whitelaw. Robert Whitelaw, notable creationist whose results pose numerous problems for modern creationism, as pointed out by this article from the Apologetics Press website. Just thought I'd preface whatever claim he's about to make with the fact that, once again, he's likely going to be making an argument that not even other creationists will accept. Robert Whitelaw, a nuclear and engineering expert at Virginia Polytech Institute, found that the production rate is not equal to the disintegration rate. Oh, okay. So you're not even going to him for anything big. I doubt he was the one to discover that, but even if he was, that's a big old nothing burger. It is not a fact that's disputed by anyone. In fact, his calculations reveal a recent, a recent, recent, Turning on of the C14 clock. Uh oh, this shows that it's probably even younger then, see? I mean, is it really surprising that a young Earth creationist calculated that the Earth is young? Honestly, I'd be more surprised if he didn't. Whitelaw's research indicates that the clock was turned on approximately 8,000 years ago. Wow. Dude, do you have Owen Wilson in your audience? Wow. 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 But also, isn't that still a couple thousand years too old for not a Dr. Kim's brand of creationism? Not sure how that helps him here. Didn't you know that even fossils have a problem with that? Not when it's an appropriate sample, they don't. 
you know, I'm guessing now that he's going to go into either the infamous mammoth fossil, where samples from two different mammoths were conflated by creationists who then claimed that they were from the same mammoth, but returned different ages. Or he could go into marine fossils, which are difficult to carbon date because of the reservoir effect. And do you know what you get when you try to carbon date seals? Reservoir dogs. You know, because seals are sometimes referred to as sea dogs. Huh? Huh? Oh, shut up. It was funny. You know you loved it. Andy doesn't go into either of those things, but I'm leaving that in because of how fantastic that joke was. There's a person, uh, there's a team of scientists. It's called Rate. Ah, yes, the Rate Project. The group of creationist scientists who all got together to try and find issues with various radiometric dating methods. They started with the conclusion that there were problems, and then worked their way back from there, rather than doing, you know, the actual scientific thing of not assuming their conclusions. Also, fun fact, but my favorite creationist scientist was involved in this one, Dr. John Baumgartner. That's the guy who published the paper about Noah's Flood, which concluded with, yeah, you know what, this shit's not possible, so how about we just come to grips with the fact that we have to appeal to magic in order to make it work? Paraphrased, obviously. Let's see which of the Rate Project stunts he's going to be referencing. Stephen Boy, PhD Hebraic and Cognate Studies. All right, I skipped him listing all the people involved in the Rate Project and saying what their PhDs are in. But I left this one in because I find it interesting that a group of scientists who are investigating radioisotopes and the age of the Earth, literally what RATE stands for, would feel that it's necessary to have someone who is an expert in Hebraic and cognate studies as part of their team. To me, this raises several red flags. It suggests that they are concerned with making sure they have a bunch of PhDs on their team and don't much care what the PhD is in, so long as they can point to a group of PhDs who think that the Earth is young. But, I mean, they had a bunch of physicists and geologists, so it's not like they have nobody who's qualified to work with radiometric dating. It's just that their willingness to include an unrelated PhD just speaks to the fact that they're more interested in appearances than substance. Also, not a Dr. Kim keeps referring to this group as though they weren't affiliated with creationist organizations when the whole team was put together by the Institute for Creation Research, an organization that just might be slightly biased here. Quote, samples were then taken from 10 different coal layers that, according to evolutionists, represent different time periods in the geologic column. Ah, okay. You're going for the one where they took samples from coal that is millions of years old and then used carbon dating on it, a dating method that, under perfect, ideal circumstances, can only give you accurate ages for samples that are less than 100,000 years old and in the vast majority of cases can only really be relied on for samples younger than 50,000 years old. Now, to quote the findings, as written by Dr. Baumgartner, although the number of samples is small, we observe little difference in C14 levels as a function of position in the geologic record. In other words, when you date samples that are old enough that the only C14 you'll find in them will be due to modern contamination, you'll likely find that the samples all contain about the same amount of C14, especially in samples that were stored in similar conditions, which these ones were. And let's not forget the fact that processing a sample for measurement will always introduce a certain amount of modern carbon. Typically, a sample must be physically and chemically cleaned, then turned into carbon dioxide gas. For coal, that would probably have just been done by burning it. Then the CO2 has to be reduced into graphite. Each step in the process doesn't just have the potential to introduce modern carbon, but is guaranteed to introduce modern carbon. In samples with enough C14 to actually get a reliable date, the amount is negligible and will be covered by the error bars in the results, but if you start with a sample that has a negligible amount of C14 to begin with, it'll completely mess everything up. This is actually another one of the limitations that makes carbon dating best suited for younger samples rather than older ones. If you find a certain fossil in this kind of layer, then they'll measure it by, you know, something million years. If you find it, find it in this year, then it'll be something million years here, several thousand years, etc. That's how they find the date of the fossil. Yeah, sort of, kind of. Yes, the best way to date a fossil is to actually date the layer that it's found in, rather than directly dating the fossil itself. In most cases, directly dating a fossil is not really possible. It was, as usual for Not a Dr. Kim, a very clunky explanation, but it was mm, kind of accurate. Let's say this fossil is in this layer and strata, which is millions of years old according to evolutionists, okay? Let's say that they say this particular strata is millions of years old. Well, it wouldn't be that it's millions of years old because evolutionists said so. 
it would be that that was the date that was calculated for the layer based on probably several different dating methods, and in order for the fossil to be included in that layer, the animal would have had to have died at some point while the layer was forming, so it has to at least be as old as the layer itself. Now, if we prove through carbon-14 that this fossil, which is in a million-year-old strata, is actually young, then that would disprove the evolutionist dating method of strata, correct? Incorrect. You haven't actually proven or disproven anything, because you can't carbon date things that are millions of years old. If you've proven anything at this point, it's that when you use a tool incorrectly, you get incorrect results. Correct. Guess what? They did prove this fossil to be young. Not with the project that you're talking about. They carbon dated coal samples that were too old for carbon dating, and when they found that they all had about the same amount of carbon-14 in them, they decided that that meant that layers that are, in reality, separated from each other by millions of years were all the same age, and that age is what carbon dating will give to any pre-flood rocks. They used a reliable dating method in the wrong way, made faulty assumptions about the results, and so came to a faulty conclusion. Or rather, they started with the faulty conclusion and worked their way back from there and figured out which faulty assumptions had to be made to reach that faulty conclusion. The chosen coal samples, which dated millions to hundreds of millions of years old, based on evolution standard time estimates, all contained measurable amounts of 14C, carbon-14. Yes. But measurable amount is kind of a meaningless term at this point. After all, an accelerator mass spectrometer, or AMS, is capable of counting individual carbon-14 atoms, so one single atom is enough to call it a measurable amount. And if you only find the one atom, given that preparing the sample is guaranteed to introduce some modern carbon, then that means that the most likely option there is that the one atom is a modern one. Carbon-14, how you date through carbon-14, so I'm going to give a very dummy example. You know, I've skipped several other times when he said this, but he just, he keeps saying dummy example as though he is capable of giving any other kind of example. And I think that's just so adorable of him. When you have a fossil, it has C14, right? Now, obviously the C14, carbon-14 is not going to be in that fossil forever, you got to understand. Because remember, assimilation and what? Disintegration, right? So even though C14 is assimilating, it's going to disintegrate. It's going to come out. Come on, man. Carbon dating is like the easiest one to get right. As the organism was alive, it continued taking in carbon-14 from its environment, and so its C14 levels would match those of the environment. When it dies, it stops taking it in, and so no more C14 is added. As time passes, the C14 decays into nitrogen-14, and we determine the age by figuring out how long it would take for the C14 levels to drop to where they are when we find it. And of course, since C14 levels in the atmosphere are not constant, scientists do need to use the carbon calibration curve when doing this calculation in order to account for the differing levels of C14 over time. Now, how it's measured is this, is that basically it's 100%. So let's say it's 100% carbon right here in the fossil. I'm not sure if he's trying to say that the entire fossil is 100% carbon. I think what he's going for is that 100% of the carbon-14 in the fossil is present at the time of death, which still seems like a really odd way to phrase it. But hey, this is Gene Kim we're talking about. I'd honestly be more surprised if everything was just 100% coherent. So if you go by every 5,730 years, half of it is chopped off. Okay, so then it'll be 50%. Yeah, half of the 100% of the carbon-14 that was present at the time of death is now gone after one half-life has passed. Really clunky explanation that leaves the door open for massive misunderstandings, but since the reason for the clunkiness of the explanation is probably because it's based on massive misunderstandings in the first place, that's not really surprising. But here's the problem. These fossils in this particular strata, which should be millions of years old, they said right here that they found me all contained measurable amounts of 14C. And do you know what's really fascinating about the amount of C14 that the Rape Project found? Well, let's quote Dr. Baumgartner again. Applying the uniformitarian approach of extrapolating 14C decay into the indefinite past translates the measured 14C to 12C ratios into ages that are on the order of 50,000 years. Now, why is this significant? 
because in the vast majority of cases, 50,000 years is the limit to how far back it's possible to get a date using carbon dating. So when you date a sample that is too old for carbon dating, knowing damn well that there will be a certain amount of modern contamination as Dr. Baumgartner did, if you then ignore the fact that the contamination is modern and treat it as though it were part of the original sample, it basically just automatically spits out a result of 50,000 years because there isn't enough C14 for it to be younger than that. But the fact that there is any C14 left means that it would be around that age. In other words, the carbon dating did not show a young Earth, nor did this exercise show carbon dating to be unreliable. The carbon dating worked exactly as it was supposed to, and the guy doing the calculation treated modern carbon as though it were original to the sample. As such, he got the oldest age that it was possible to get for the sample. He then started with wanting to get an age of 4200 years for these samples as his conclusion, because then he could lump them all in together as pre-flood, and so he made some assumptions about pre-flood conditions that would allow him to get there with that calculation. And no, he did not justify these assumptions or explain why he chose the numbers that he did, but then, wow! 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 wow. He got the number that he was looking to get from the beginning! It's not really all that impressive, to be honest. In all cases, careful precautions were taken to eliminate any possibility of contamination from other sources. So this is genuine. Yeah, that's just not possible. Like I said earlier, the process of preparing the sample for examination in the AMS will necessarily introduce modern carbon, as well as there being the possibility of contamination in the AMS itself. Sometimes small amounts of carbon can stick to the walls of the ion source in the AMS, and can then be transferred to the next sample that is measured in it. Sometimes ions that are not radiocarbon, but have the same atomic weight as radiocarbon, can be misidentified as radiocarbon by the AMS. Hell, cosmic rays can even have an impact. All of these effects are tiny, they're not really significant enough to worry about in appropriate samples, but in inappropriately old samples, they will add up to enough C14 to call detectable and then slap a 50,000 year age on it. Significant amounts. See, not small, 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 small amounts. Significant. Significant here meaning the smallest amount on which it is possible to perform a calculation. And that is starting with the assumption that is known to be false, that there was zero contamination. So Not a Dr. Kim titled his video here saying that this dating method proves God. Problem is, even if I grant everything that he said, the best that he can get is that the universe isn't as old as we thought. That's not very compelling as far as proof of God goes, but also everything he said was wrong, so it's a moot point anyway. But speaking of carbon. You all know that carbon dioxide is the primary driver of climate change, right? In order to fight climate change, we're going to need to use every tool we have available to us, not just in limiting carbon emissions, but also in capturing existing carbon from the atmosphere. REN, the sponsor of today's video, is a simple and effective way that you can make a difference in the climate crisis. It's a website where you can go through a simple questionnaire to calculate your carbon footprint, and then offset it by funding a diverse mix of carbon reduction projects. One of the projects I haven't mentioned yet is the Clean Cooking Fuel Project, which works with Mandulus Energy to provide clean fuel and high efficiency stoves to the more than 1 million refugees from South Sudan and Eastern Congo that are living in Uganda. Right now, most of the families living in the area need to use firewood to cook, and the current stoves that they use produce enough smoke that the people in the house are exposed to essentially two packs of cigarettes worth of smoke per day. Replacing firewood with charcoal made from discarded farm waste will not only be much healthier for the refugees, but also they won't need to cut down trees for their cooking, allowing the forest in the area to regrow. And trees are one of the most efficient carbon capture technologies that we have available to us, so this project has the potential to have an enormous impact on not only climate change, but also just making people's lives better. And as an added bonus, once the fuel is burned, it becomes biochar, which residents can then sell back to Mandulus Energy. But of course, we all know that putting the onus of preventing climate change entirely on individuals is completely unreasonable when the biggest drivers of climate change are large corporations that are exploiting regulatory problems, and that's why a portion of your donation to REN will also go to fund policy projects that push politicians to enact legislation, regulation, and policy changes that will help fight climate change. So offset your carbon footprint with Wren. The first hundred people to sign up using the link in the description below will have ten extra trees planted in their name. 
Thanks for watching, thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon manager, and special thanks as always to my patrons, Thomas V. Lohmeyer, and all the rest, who are better lovers because they know how to give. I don't always have to tie it into the video, sometimes I can just say nice things about them. If you'd like to be better in bed, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vicerhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com, which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time!